you see so much manipulation, so many lies, and so many con artists in here. This is just like a snake pit. I've been doing this so long, you'd think I would learn, you know? It's, a, it's the same old thing every day. It's a hard way to live. Jail is terrible. It's no place to be. But, you know, we keep making the decisions to come back. I'm here for home invasion. Yeah, I got um, eight different charges, from kidnapping to armed robbery to burglary and first degree. My whole family's been incarcerated since I've been a kid. My mom, my dad, everybody. Your mom? Yeah, my mom's doing 18 years right now in Perryville. She got for two, what? She got two more years left for the same charges as me. Home invasion, I got about eight different charges. OK, no, wait, wait. Was this the one with $100,000 worth of electronics equipment? He put down electronics, but it was a drug rig. He was a dope dealer. Oh, so you robbed a dope dealer. We robbed a dope dealer. Now, so he couldn't call the cops and say we robbed his dope. So here's the thing I wouldn't do is rob a dope dealer. Well, most of them don't call the cops. I would not rob a dope dealer, because he will either go to jail or get killed. Killed, yeah. Mm. I mean. What about a regular person? No, <laughs> I don't hit innocent people. Fina Dean is a dangerous woman, and it's very important to remember the facts of her crime. This crime is just the latest in a very lengthy resume. She broke into a home, tied up the victim with cables, then stabbed the victim in the back with a sword she found in the home, then left him for dead on the floor while she and her accomplice stole nearly $100,000 of electronic equipment. All this got her charges of first-degree burglary, kidnapping, armed robbery, ag assault. All of these are felonies, so don't be fooled. Angelina Key, it's A-N-G-E-L-I-N-A-K-E-Y. I got nine years for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So, and it happens. Hang around the wrong people, you know, it, it happens. It initially started, I was robbed, and I, um, Instead of calling the cops, I took matters in my own hands and kicked open the door and assaulted people inside. So um, that's how it all began. I got placed on IPS because of it. Then they kept coming to my house. Um, Who kept coming to your house? My IPS officer kept coming to the house and would do surprise searches. And he found a gun in my home um, that was inside of my drawer, um, which was strictly for protection, you know, because I obviously am gay and um, have two women living in a home. Um, the neighborhood at the time that we moved in was not that great, um, so they came in and found it, so they got me for possessing a gun by a prohibited person. She is about to start serving a nine-year sentence. She pled guilty to second-degree burglary. She entered in a home, stole about $1,000 worth of belongings that she planned to sell, but a Phoenix, Arizona police chopper spotted her overhead. She fled the scene hiding in the laundry room of a nearby apartment complex where she was arrested. She pled guilty to giving a false report to law enforcement, dangerous drug violations, and marijuana. I'm Armithia Burks, A-R-M-I-T-H-E-A, Burks, B-U-R-K-S. Yes, I was sentenced about a month ago, and um, I'll be getting out here shortly. What are you in for? Um, an accident. An aggravated assault with a deadly weapon that I did not whoa, do. Whoa, whoa. What possessed you to do it with a cigarette? What did he do to get the burn? He just, um, he aggravated me and provoked me so much. What and did he do? I gotta get He that. went in there and he got liquor, and I hadn't been drinking for a while. I, I no longer wanted to have the notion to want to drink anymore. I wanted to get my life together and get in church, and he just is an alcoholic. He just came with that drug abuse and that alcohol abuse and brought what it back here. What are you doing with him? Um, I thought that he was willing to change his life also, as I was, so I allowed him to come here after me. Armethia Burks, a mother of five, and now 
after a criminal history with three separate cocaine charges, possession of stolen property, obstruction of law enforcement, even prostitution, she's looking at hard time, hard jail time for aggravated assault. After she gets into a fight with her boyfriend at the Walmart and burns him in the back of the head with a cigarette, threatens to stab him with a knife, cuts him on the hand as well as the chest, that could have been a murder. And now, five children are without a mother. My name is Marissa Lovell, M-A-R-I-S-S-A-L-E-V-E-L, a.k.a. Pineapple. I've got four charges. I've got an aggravated robbery, dangerous. I've got credit card theft. Yeah. Okay. And then I've got resisting arrest and tampering with evidence. Those are my four original charges. I've already signed my plea, and I'm going to prison for four years for the aggravated robbery. Marissa Level is no stranger to the legal system. She's a mother of twins, and her parental rights have been completely severed. She can no longer see her own children. Why? Well, she's already convicted for possession of drugs, an aggravated DUI. Now, she's looking at another aggravated assault charge after she goes into the home of an acquaintance, steals a credit card, pulls a knife on him, and when he tries to stop her, she challenges him to come at her. Coupled with the ag assault, theft of the credit card, resisting arrest, tampering with evidence. The evidence? It's a bag of heroin. According to her complaint, she either swallowed it or threw it away while fighting with police officers. My name is Rosalinda Leon, R-O-S-A-L-E-O-N, Rosa Leon. I've been in and out since um, about 2006, 20, age of 25. I started messing up. I got into drugs really bad with the boyfriend, and it hasn't been the same. I got three children, two in CPS and one on the way. I'm on probation for aggravated assault non-dangerous, um, not repetitive, and I just picked up a non- But I mean, what happened? A trespassing. Um, a lady, I was hanging on poster boards. This is the truth. I was hanging on poster boards, and just, I was high on some crystal meth, and started acting, singing like Cindy Lauper or Madonna, and, and I, like I usually do. And um, it was really dumb, and, and she accused me, of, it's all over a guy. She accused me of telling her I was gonna kill her with the hammer, and I said, that's almost attempted murder. Do you think I'm crazy? I wasn't raised like that. And I told the cops, but the cops were like, you're high anyways, you know, you need to go in. But I didn't know they were going to put me down for aggravated assault. Well, upon that, that was a, a July arrest. Upon that, I lost, that's when I lost custody of my kids because here they don't transport you to the CPS meetings. Rosa Leon, a mother of two, has a third baby on the way. She described her battle with drugs to me, but you got to remember, she threatened to kill a woman while wielding a hammer, screaming, I'm going to kill you, you effing Chicana. And now she's facing ag assault charges. That's just the latest in a very long list of crimes on her rap sheet. Yes, she's a mother of two with a third child on the way, a child who's probably going to be born behind bars. Before tackling motherhood, she needs to deal with her own issues. Will she lose yet a third child? Who is here for the killing? I know somebody is. Who is it? You? Daddy's girl? It was just about the marijuana. Okay, medical marijuana. First of all, who's sick? I'm prescribed marijuana. For what? For my chronic body pains and different things. Stephanie Conley may not look like someone accused of murder, but allegedly when Conley goes out to buy marijuana, a dispute breaks out and it leaves one person dead with multiple stab wounds and Conley facing charges of murder one. Now, she's pled guilty to marijuana in 2010. Now she's heading to trial for murder. I clean like every morning. I have a bunkie, we switch off cleaning. I taste my shower and read. I read my Bible after my shower. The only television we're allowed to watch here is the Food Network. So um, some girls watch that, some walk around in circles, you know, trying to get exercise. Really, I just walk around or write or uh, draw. I like to play spades because it keeps you busy during the day. 
I come out and play cards or whatever and communicate with the other inmates. My day is immersed in enjoying the company of women that I never thought that I would be interested or intrigued by. And you just eat chow and uh, watch the Food Channel, all this good food you can't eat. Then, you know, at 5 o'clock, uh, we get our chow for dinner. Um, and then medications again, and we go to sleep and start it all over again the next day. It's, a, it's the same old thing every day. We wake up every day and do the same thing over. One day is like the next here. It's the same thing every day, every day, just for months at a time. <laughs> How long does it take you to get over having to go to the bathroom in front of everybody? I'm so comfortable now, it does not even phase me. I'm it's, like, it's, yeah, stay out the room. You see the doors shut? It's weird. Just, yeah, just stay down there. I guess there. it's just different. It's yeah. so crazy, because I'll, like, undress in front of my roommate and everything and not care. I mean, totally nude, you know, and not even care, but I won't go to the bathroom <laughs> with her in the bath in there. It's so crazy. I'm like, Bunky, you got to go. And you got to have the baby powder and be like, Phew. clean the room out. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, it's horrible. I was teasing <laughs> and pregnant. You know, if I don't have Bunky for a long go time. You got to go. It's gotten a lot easier, but when I first started coming to jail, and the first time I went to prison, it was like... They're not in the comfort of their own home, and so the cell is their home. That's their living area 24-7, and so basically their cell represents them. And a lot of the females here are super sensitive to cleanliness, and it's kind of known amongst each other that you need to be really clean or you're not going to do well here. I'm real, real particular on who lives with me. Like, most of the officers know that. I won't live with somebody that doesn't clean or doesn't shower. I'm really big on that. Has hair everywhere. I can't do hair. Who spits in the sink? Like, I'm just, that's a no-no. You know, it's a little messy right now, but basically, um, you know, just keep magazines on your side, your paperwork. Um, I don't really do much writing, although I do receive mail, um, but I don't really care too much for writing. Um, and then my roommate does the same down here. Um, she's a little more neater than I am, so uh, she keeps her stuff in her little bag down there underneath, so. And then we share the same, obviously, the same toilet and the same sink. Um, we share the desk. Um, Pregos get the bottom bunk. So we sleep on the bottom, especially when we're pregnant. We get food, um, cheese and bread, and a fruit. We have to drink lots of bottled water so we keep uh, the old soda bottles. We get our prenatals. We get Jesus and stuff like that. We can have some books. Um, keep our paperwork under here. And pray in our dreams will get let out. <laughs> I keep my room neat just because it's like, it's so small. It, you don't like to not know where your stuff is at, you know, and it's hard. It's just easier when everything's just in one place all the time and then you don't have to worry about, I don't have a bunkie now, so it's, I just like to know where everything's at, but when I do have a bunkie, then I'm even more aware of where my things are because I'm like, oh, I don't want this lady to be in my stuff, you know, so. Yeah, I've had problems <laughs> with roommates, but. I just kick him out. <laughs> I guess that's the best way you can say it. you gotta go. You mean I could tell them one time, but if they don't want to do it, they gotta go. That's just how I do it. And the, the officers here are pretty good. As long as you don't like go out all out and go crazy or fight them, and you tell them there's an issue. I've been telling this girl over and over again. It's just not working out. If there's empty cell, they're pretty much move on. Okay. We're in the control tower of the housing unit, and this is basically the, the hub of it all. Uh, all the doors open and close from in here. One officer stays in here at all times. The officer that's in here at all times keeps a visual on the officers that are doing the walks and looking at the inmates and making sure that the inmates aren't doing anything they're not supposed to. The jail isn't supposed to be good, you know, but... I mean, there are people here for, your, for the people that are for the first time. It is what it is. Get from it what you can. Food is horrible. The food is disgusting. I think the food here is one of the worst parts for me. Uh, increments of 12 hours between meals, I mean, really. I ate the food here. Wow. It was not bad. Yeah, we don't oh, like yeah. Yeah. Did Arpaio give me a rigged meal? What did he eat? Yeah, yeah. what did he eat? I had eat? fresh bread, like oh, a yeah, hunk. Not as good. It was like a hunk. I had uh, peanut butter. Yeah, that good. peanut butter was good. Stay for a night. It is good. Yeah. It's it's good. good. It's 
Was your fruit rotten? I, I didn't open the fruit. It was a big old orange. Well, yours was a big old orange. I thought you were talking about the dinner. Yeah, I thought you were talking about dinner. I'm going to give Arpaio hell on this. You gave me a fake lunch. Yeah, you didn't have a Okay, what's the dinner? You didn't have a slop. When you when you're at you actually day. call it slop. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's called, called slop. slop. Was anybody here raised <laughs> on a farm? No. 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 Okay, I was raised in farmland, and I know what real slop is when you slop the pigs. <laughs> no, okay, your slop is probably call seasoned. This slop. <laughs> okay, what is it? Take a Salisbury steak dinner and no, cut up, cut not. it up. And don't, no sure. salt, no pepper, salt. nothing. Of course. Potatoes on the side, or just regular beans she's with no salt, no pepper. Good. No, it's and that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's because she eats it. That's because she eats it. So okay. she's okay. convinced herself. But what that. else can you eat? Um, commissary. But yeah, that's just junk food. food. It's that's, all right, we make it, stuff. Wait, you, know, you make stuff, like what? Popcorn burritos. What is a popcorn burrito? It tastes like eggs, so it's like a sausage egg burrito. You But you soften the popcorn where it looks like scrambled eggs. You put it in the burrito with some cheese and some pork rinds you and then on, some hot pretzels. Yeah, exactly. It's that good. That whole meal cost you like ten to twelve dollars. What do you eat? I eat menudo or I eat. I put chicken, the sausage log, um, popcorn, chicharrones, and I put a little bit of cheese and I mix it all together and make a burrito or menudo. You get the chicharrones it's all about and the, bag. the um, pretzels, and you put. Like you get cheese, you squeeze it in with hot water and mix it together, and you pour it in and, and you let it soak for a little bit and you eat manudo. Put some hot sausage chub in with it. Yeah. And you get mm. all this from the commissary. Yeah. Oh yeah. You can do so much. You can make and sweet and sour the... with the jolly oh, yeah. and yeah. the ketchup, and you mm -hmm. mix it together and you put it in with rice and like orange oh, you your rice. Make orange that. chicken. But the jelly oh, yeah. and the oranges or the orange Kool-Aid flavor. That so it's like so chicken meat. Yeah. Like they do too. And you put orange Kool-Aid in it, and you let it marinate for a little while, and then you put that into your rice that you get out of the out of the tray at night. Sometimes they give us mixed vegetables and a pouch of that tuna with the rice and the mixed vegetables. Um, the food that we get sometimes is rotten and moldy, and and half the time people are throwing it away because it's no good. It's not fit to be eaten. I do. Um, fortunately, I was um, responsible enough of a parent to give my children up and let somebody else parent them and be a mother to them because I was in no position to be that. I was selfless by giving my kids up, but I was selfish as being an adult being. I didn't have time for my kids, to put it honestly, you know, and I didn't have the capacity within myself to love my children the way they deserve to be loved. Okay, here's my first question. How do you stand being away from your family. I mean, how do you do that? It's tough. It is. It's very really tough. difficult. Yeah. So that's the most toughest thing for myself. I'm used to it. Why? My whole family has been incarcerated since I've been a kid. Do any of your children come to see you? No, I have five children. I have twins, too. Good and one of my Lord twins has the, the baby. You have yeah. five children? Yeah, my kids are grown, and I have the five-year-old baby. My children Who's are grown. Got, and the baby. And my baby, the five-year-old, is with my 20-year-old that I came here to visit in Arizona. So she has my five-year-old. But how do you stand being away from your children? That's hard. I am. Um, I'm so used to the one that's been being been abandoned in my life, and I just uh, it's by the grace of, and mercy of God. I this time around I abandoned. So and I'm the one who's used to being abandoned, and I abandoned my family this time. So I feel really horrible. For me, it's very difficult. Um, due to my circumstances, I don't have my mother's phone number. I don't have contact with my brother. I very barely have contact with my stepfather. Um, so not having my freedom and being able to call anyone I want to, when I want to, is one of the hardest parts. Um, it's extremely lonely to feel like you have no one. And um, when you're watching everybody else in the pod get on the phone and call their family, and you don't have one to call is is heartbreaking um so i think that's something that a lot of women here experience because not all of us have families with money not all of us have families that write us you have a little ink let me see it an e and a t for my twins for your twins yeah. eight years old mm -hmm. is it boy girl a boy and a girl are you going to try to get them back uh, my rights have been severed uh, my rights were severed in October, but the foster mother is very kind and she lets me maintain a relationship with my children and uh, my stepdad sees them often. So. Do you like the mom? 
Um, yeah, I, well, I've been writing to my kids specifically. I don't write letters to her, but that's a very good idea. I should probably work but on do you, that. I said, do you like her? Oh, yeah, she's wonderful. She's amazing. I've been doing this for like 33 years of my 58 living. I'm not proud to say that. And I know my daughters, I'm very lucky that they don't despise me or, you know, just literally not acknowledge me. Uh, I'm very lucky for that. Came in here when I was pregnant. I did like t um, my whole pregnancy here. They released me and they gave me a chance and I did really good. And then probably about two years after being out, I relapsed and it took me four months to come back in here. I got a 12 year old and a three year old. Girls, boys. Oh my god, my 12 year old is a girl and my three year old is a boy. And do you get to see them? Um, I get to see my little boy. Yeah, but since what custody I'm at, he has to be behind glass and it's kind of the waiting just to get into visitation sometimes is so packed. He doesn't have enough patience to sit and wait by the time they bring me down there. So most of the time, by the time I get there and see him, he has to leave. Have you found women here that have been pregnant before in jail that have kind of given you some, you know, advice or spoken to you about what it was like? Um, we talked, but not really. We usually talk about how the kids are, and if we see each other ever again, we say, where's the baby now? You know, a lot of us get our kids taken away from CPS. This time, I don't want to lose my baby. I want to keep my baby, so I'm hoping that, you know, with my plea agreement and everything, I can get out 10 months from, um, no, what is it, six months from now. So I got a year sentence, so that'll be about 10 months I have to do. But yeah, us pregnant women, we usually will remember each other because that's the hardest thing is being pregnant in here. It's a lot of emotions up and down and stuff. I have an 18-year-old daughter and a 15-year-old son. In spite of me, they've actually been, they've actually grown up pretty well. So my daughter has gotten accepted into college. She'll be going to U of A with a full scholarship next year. So I'm really proud of her. And my son is doing well as a freshman in high school out here, so. You know, but um, but that's because their dad mostly has done a really good job raising them. And it's hard for my family to see me here. You know, um, I don't think anyone wants to see a, a loved one behind bars. Um, my grandmother um, is real supportive of me. You know, she's um, 79. She comes up here every week faithfully, and I love her for that. It's hard to be a mom from behind bars. It's hard to be a family member here. Period. And then you have people here that don't have family, and it's hard to see that. Being without your family is definitely the toughest part. Um, a lot of people come in here on drugs. Um, you know, they're doing drugs out there. They, this is their time to sober up. Um, and they don't realize what they don't, what they miss. You know, they don't realize the family that's actually there by their side until they come in here, you know. And by that time, it's too late for a lot of them, you know. A lot of them are headed off for a long time. Children who have mothers behind bars how awful that must be for them. And I noticed that unless I pried it out of these women, they were very nonchalant about their children on the outside. They were very stoic, very calm about having all of their parental rights severed. I, I, I just can't imagine being away from my children and it not tearing me apart. Lopez, I don't ask for sympathy. I just asked for a um, little bit more help with some of the programs, maybe a little, you know, some kind of thing for the drug addiction. That's all. I don't ask for sympathy because I understand that I am a, I'm a criminal. You know, I do deserve to be treated bad because I don't think about my children or use out in the public. But uh, I do ask for some more programs. People make mistakes. We, we make mistakes. And we're not the things that we've done. They're just things that we've done. We are individuals. You know, we deserve second chances. We deserve the opportunity to get life right. And, um, you know, I can only speak for myself when I say that, you know, this time, this is my last time. This is my last chance. So I hope to get it right this time. So I'm afraid when you go it's back out, you're going to go right back with the same That's people and get all caught up in the same stuff. For me, I know when I leave these doors, yeah. it's like we return to the party and the people are like, where have you been? At? It's been like six you months. Know you know, they don't miss like, you. I came back for the party. They're like, the only people that are missing you are your That's family. what it feels like you, you, you go back to the party. You yeah. away from something that was not going right for you out there. Amen. And, and you know, the man above knows the reason and you know the reason. Yeah. And it Amen. just, do some soul well, searching I just wonder and figure sometimes. it out, you know. Yeah, we usually, if you would have died out there. I've been coming in and out of jail 
all my life. And I'm, I'm finally done, but I'm done because I've grown out of the stupidity, I think, you know? I didn't get it the first time, I didn't get it the second time, I didn't get it the fourth or fifth time, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm at that age to where, you know, I need to do something different if I want to continue to live. You know the old saying, don't trust someone that bleeds for seven days and don't die? Yeah, living with a bunch of females like living in a pit of snakes. You know, it's constantly watch your back. You're around these women all day long. You smell them, you're with them, you know what's going on with their life. You know, you see so much manipulation, so many lies, and so many con artists in here. It just gets frustrated to the point where you just don't talk to nobody no more. Everybody's trying to get somebody for something. If it's for commissary, if it's for monies to get bailed out, everybody's trying to do something. It's like there's no more honest people left. There's always going to be that, that personality issue, I think, between some women, but we try to get along. You know, you become family with each other. That's all you've got in here. You know, when you don't have your own family or the support of your own family, this is all you've got. I don't like to associate with many people because they're just so much drama. Like, you can't trust anything that anybody says. Everything that everybody says is usually just a lie or a glorifying of their crimes. It's hard to even discuss, like, my charges with people because they look at me like, you ain't here for nothing. But to me, it's something. But to them, it's like, if it's not, um... Home evasions, murders, or something that's considered small. It sometimes reminds me of little kids, you know, because it's a bunch of women who, you know, of course, have their cycles and get emotional and get, you know, um, all these different feelings that happen and, you know, all this he said, she said. And I've known some women here for like a, f a long time, so I just keep stay around what I'm used to, what I know, and I stay away from what I don't know. I feel out of sort sometimes, but. When you get to know each individual in here, you become friends, you know, and I feel like there's a lot of innocent people here. And I don't know. Maybe I'm too trusting. I don't know what it is, but I've come to grow as a family with a lot of the girls here, and they're really nice. Two, four, six, seven. Big six to the board. How many do it take to get on the board? Oh, big six or big five? Can I get in? Yeah, I always keep to myself, and then as people, you, you sort of let them come to you, is what I learned. Because you sort of go up to people, and they're like, they pull away from you, like, who are you, you know? <laughs> yeah, because you hear a lot of comments, you're just a crack whore, you're just a crackhead prostitute, you know, especially when the drug dealers come in, and you're like, man, get out of here. <laughs> I've seen a lot of stuff in here, um, believe it or not, and it's crazy. I just sit back and watch, you know, that's all I do. I don't get involved with it. You know, I don't, I just let it be. It is what it is, you know. And then afterwards, when everybody's done, a lot of people do come to me to ask for advice, you know, and I'll give my two cents. There's always, always an ulterior, ulterior motive behind, there's, an, there's always a hidden agenda. Everything, you cannot take anything for face value from anybody, you know. I mean, you can swear, oh, well, I've been doing this time with this person for so long, you know. There's a hidden agenda. Come on, ladies. Come on, Leon. Let's go. When you go to bed at night, do you, what do you think about? Do you think about your children? Do you think about just getting the hell out of here? What do you think about? Personally, I think about whether or not this next nine years that I have to do is going to go by quick. How I'm going to spend it. What I'm going to do to, you know, to keep, you know, keep a clear head and not, you know, fall off track and, you know, fall into a depression mode or, you know. I think if this, is this going to be the time to change my life? Because so much has happened and nothing has opened my eyes. So is this what needs to change my life? Is, mm. something, is this what I need mm. to actually go? Because I've had many opportunities in life. I've had really good people in my life. I have really good support team in my life where I've had opportunities to do so much with my life, but I still chose to go back to the neighborhood and gangbang. I've been moved to Oklahoma. I've been moved to Scottsdale. I mean, I went to the best high school, Chaparral High School in Arizona. Like, I've had opportunities, but I chose to go other way. Like, is, am I finally going to get the tools that have been given to me and actually use them? I hate the fact that I'm going away for so very long, but um, hopefully this time will be the last time. 
and hopefully this time I will learn my lesson and that I'm, I'm in some ways lucky because for me this might be the one time that saves me. It could be the one time and the last time that changes me. I'm a recovering heroin addict and um, I've been in and out of the system for quite some time now and I'm tired and I'm ready for a change and hopefully this four years I'm about to do is going to do that. I'm done. I'm, I'm definitely done. I'm too old for this. You know, I'm 43 and my health is not good, so I regret that I chose the lifestyle that I lived in my past because I didn't have to. A change, I need a change. Um, a change, I, I barely admitted to my probation officer that I've, I've been doing drugs. So I'm hoping like to change now, you know. I'm hoping for some kind of change, something, and you know. People can come in here and they can complain, but somebody's always gonna have it worse than you. Like, no matter what you're facing, no matter how much time, somebody always has it worse than you, whether you're getting 25 to life, or natural life, death penalty. Like, when, when women come in here and they, and they complain, like, I just feel like everybody should be responsible for your, actions. for your actions, exactly. Like, I don't like this life, you know what I'm saying, but I'm not gonna come in here and start, like, crying, crying about it when I'm the one that put myself in here. You know, they want to go into what happened to them as a kid or they've been raped or this or that, but you know what? Even us as inmates, even as cops, even probably you guys, there's everybody's had a bad life. You mean it's what you make of it. We chose to find another way out. You guys chilled to build a better life. You mean sometimes people have to go to counseling. We don't know what's behind somebody else's story, so stop trying to make excuses and blame everybody else. You do this. You get out and you still go back to the streets. It's your fault, so stop coming here. And that's where most of the animosity comes in here, is the complaining and somebody crying and just, God, you did it. Shut the up, oh, please, you did it. And then they come in like six months later and the cops get used to it. The cops can tell you, they see the same faces over and over again. It's like a revolving door. Yeah, I know, I've been in here many times. And they're like, you're back again, Dean? Yep. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> If you come to jail and you like it, keep doing what you're doing. If you come to jail and you don't like it, it's simple. Stop doing what you're doing. Make different decisions and you'll have different choices. I used to have all these dreams about when I would see my fiance again. I would dream, I would look up and he'd be there. And it, they, were, they were so real. Uh, but do you ever dream? Mm -hmm. what, what do you dream? What is the dream? When you walk out the door, what happens? I don't walk out the door. I'm always at home. I just, I'm You're at home. home. And my mom tells me it wasn't, you know, you don't remember, you got out, you don't. And I tell her, no, I was like, you know, and I walk outside and the sun's shining on me and I could feel the, the heat from the sun and the, the fresh air and everything. But I never walk out the doors. I'm always home. Now, family. why does that make you cry? Because I want to go home. Because all I think about is my family. Sometimes all you need is a good foundation. Exactly. All you need is a couple of months. All you need is a few years to get you rolling in the right direction. This may be the last time. I hope and I pray that this is the last time for me and that my life will get better after this. I tend to think that every time I come in here, I'll change, I'll change, I'll change. But I just feel the drugs pull me back out. You know, not even however long it takes me to go back to my old neighborhood, it's, it's hard because that's about my sober time right there. So the bus ride over there and, you know, there's a lot of dreams and goals and situations that we dream of and think of. But as soon as we hit that fresh air, it's, it's over. <laughs> Most of us have dreams that we'll never, we'll never see um, realized. And that's a hard thing. But as far as um, doing the things that I wanted to do, becoming a doctor, um, you know, things like that, that's never going to happen for me now. Anybody got a message you want to send out? Jaleesa, if you hear me, um, I love you and I'm sorry. And I just want you to be here for me. Give me another chance. I never meant to abandon you guys. I just want to say I love my twins very much. They know that. ET phone home. Um, my mother, uh, please contact me. It's been quite some time and you know I'm here. Please get in touch with me. My brother, I'm sorry. My stepdad, you're the bomb. I love you. I just wanted to say to the foster care parents, um, thanks. My kids shouldn't suffer for me being a drug addict. Um, and I just appreciate you guys and God bless you. 
I just want to thank everybody that supports me because they still have faith when I don't. And what do you want to say? I just want to thank um, my sister and Erica for being there for me um, through this whole entire thing every single day, no matter what. They don't miss a beat. I love you guys. I love you, Jen. I love you, Mom and Brandy, all my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law. I love you guys. And thank you for supporting me. And I'll see you guys soon. You know, I could blame it on everything, but when it comes right down to it, it was me. You know, I'm, I made the wrong decisions. I made the wrong choices. You know, everybody has free will. And my free will was always on a path of destruction. I just look at it like, you know, I can't let my time do me. I have to do my time. I have to, I, I chose to put myself with that crowd, with those people, you know. So I have to, of course, accept the consequences that are given to me and I have no choice but to go and do the time. I mean, it's, it's what we deserve actually being incarcerated in here. I mean, we don't think about who we're hurting or who's moms or what children. We don't actually think about none of that stuff, our own children, until we're incarcerated. <laughs> if I could do it all over again, I would never lose my freedom because freedom is one thing that we have that we don't have in here, you know, and freedom is very precious because and we, when we're out there, we take advantage of it, you know, and it's not something that you play with. It's something that you guard and you cherish, you know, because freedom is, is, everything to me if you come to jail just stay to yourself it's not a place to make friends you come here by yourself you'll leave by yourself can you say goodbye friend in sign language for me